Senior producer from NFL Films, Greg Cosell, joins us to talk some X's and O's for this divisional playoff tilt between the Bills and the Chiefs. And, Greg, I want to start here. As you know, we often put you in the prediction game based on past oh, come on and now, stuff. Chris. I don't predict. But here's the All thing. All I will say is anything short of seven possessions and seven touchdowns will probably be a monumental failure, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right. Why should we expect yeah. anything else? Right? I, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I wanted I wanted to begin here though, Greg. Back in week five, the the Bills offense comes out in a yep. lot of closed formation looks. They basically yep. go completely away from their tendencies. I think I counted like upwards of twenty plays in twelve or twenty one personnel. A lot of early designed runs for Josh. Yes. And it really got them in a good rhythm early, knowing that Dable is not one to do the same thing twice. I'm very, very curious as to what they turn to this time around. You know, Chris, you know what's really sad is I I guess being with you guys, I just had a funny feeling you were going to mention this. So I went back and looked at my notes and saw that the Bills played 19 snaps of 21 personnel and six snaps of 12 personnel. So I, I guess we're getting a little too close here, Chris, that I knew you were going to ask me that. So that, that's a really bad thing. Um, but uh, th- there's no way they will do the same thing. No way. Um, now, that doesn't mean you'll never see 21 personnel, clearly, uh, because they don't really have a second tight end right now, correct? Um, yeah. They, they, they use, they they use probably... Reggie Gilliam. They use Reggie Gilliam, yeah, who's I mean, he's technically kind of a, a hybrid. fullback. Yeah, he's sort of a hybrid the way they line him up, a fullback and tight end. Um, but again, like I said, that doesn't mean they won't line up at all in 21 personnel. But I think you will not see the emphasis on that uh, personnel package the way you did in week five. No question. Yeah, and if it, the way this game breaks down is these are very different teams now. Three months after yes. they played the first time. What are, your, what are the most stark differences in your mind? Well... Um, I, I do not believe, and I'm trying to remember week five. I went back and looked at my notes, but I can't remember every detail. W- was Melvin Ingram on the Chiefs at that no, point? No, he had not no. been traded yet. No. No. So that's when the Chiefs were still trying to, to use Chris Jones as a defensive end. And that didn't work out really well. He's really a phenomenal defensive tackle. And um, I think that, you know, now with Ingram, who's kind of a D-end and also a joker, they move him around. And with Jones predominantly playing inside, which is where he's really good, I think their defensive front is much better. I think in terms of what the Chiefs do defensively, they don't necessarily do a whole lot that's different. They've just gotten better at it. You kind of know what you're going to get. Um, you know, offensively, look, the the Bills – We've talked about this before. The Bills are the most quarterback-centric team in the league. They rely on Josh Allen. And and you made a very interesting point about Josh and the designed run game. I actually did a piece on that in the matchup show for this week because that's a really important thing that they do. They might not do it, you know, 10 times a game. But one thing you can be sure of, they'll do it early in the game on their first or second possession. They do it on third and short, anywhere from two to six, and they will absolutely do it in the red zone. In fact, in that game against the Chiefs on the first possession, on third and two, Allen ran for 22 yards. He also had a nine-yard touchdown run on a counterplay. So I think that's a major factor. The, the Bills have clearly tried to run the ball more um, and here you're seeing the uh, the nine yard touchdown from that first matchup. Uh, the right. Bills have clearly tried to run the ball more, but I think when push comes to shove, this is still a Josh Allen offense. Right. And the other thing too, though, is and we've seen this when they run him early in games, if he's able to snap off a 20 yard run, yeah. like he did against the Patriots last week, he had a 26 yarder on the first that he, that drive. He, yeah, on the first drive that he ran out of bounds. It was like the whole complexion of the Patriots' defense changed because they have to respect the possibility of that. My question to you, Greg, is all the time when we ask Josh and the offense about him running the ball, they say, well, we like it because we've got one more man than they do. And I understand how that, I understand how that all works. What is the likelihood, do you believe, in light of Josh's success running the ball, that the Chiefs employ a spy. Do you know anything about Spagnolo's history of utilizing a spy? I can't sit here and say that he's never done it. 
I don't think he wants to do that. Um, and I'm not, again, you're basically saying assign someone to Josh Allen is what you're basically yeah. saying. Um, well, for instance, I'll give you an example on the 22 yard run that he had against the chiefs in the uh, first matchup, which did come on the first possession. Um, basically what happened was is Singletary led through and he had no one to block. He blocked no one and he ran for 22 yards. So you, you can deploy a spy, but because of the numbers game, you do actually have a blocker for that spy. It's not as if you don't have a blocker. Uh, so I'm not sure how that necessarily helps. Uh, I'm not smart enough to know all those intricacies of defense and how that might be coached, but you know, that automatically does not stop the, the quarterback yeah. design run game. And the, and the cold run game to Josh Allen, the quarterback, is something that the Bills have that not a lot of other teams can deploy to that extent. And, no. and as you said, I, I've said it a couple of times on the show and over the years I said it about Cam Newton as well. They're the best short yardage goal line running back in the league because they got right. the ball in their hands every time. And you gotta, you got to deal with it even if it's not the cold play. And I think their ability to call that, and even with Josh in the running game, on the, on the nine-yard run we've been watching – it's wildcat every snap. Correct. And and they've done such a good job now because, you know, one of the things that stood out watching tape, and I know you guys have seen this as well, is Isaiah McKenzie. I mean, we're not going to sit here and say he's Debo Samuel because he's not. But clearly they're, they're using him in the backfield more. They're using him in motion more. Um, it'll be interesting to see because my feeling about McKenzie versus Beasley is if you're going, if you feel based on your tape study that you're going to get more man coverage, then McKenzie is a really, he's the better option than Beasley. If you feel in given situations, you're going to get zone coverage. Beasley is the better option because Beasley has such a great feel for finding and settling in zone voids. But if you're, if you feel you're going to get man, whatever that down and distance is based on your film study, then be then McKenzie, because he can run away from man coverage. And then with the Chiefs defensively in the AFC title game last year, they went heavy dime. Um, and it, for the most part, it kind of held the Bills' offense in check to a certain extent. I, again, we're expecting things to change. And we know that but Tyron Matthew is kind of their wild card player. He just kind of roams around sometimes with no wow. real coverage assignment. Maybe just kind of get into how they use him yeah. most recently. For sure. First of all, they do play a lot of dime. They play among the highest percentage of dime personnel of any defense in the league. It's, it's I believe, over 25 percent. I would not expect that to change, Chris, because that's what they do. Um, I'd be really surprised if within one week you're going to see a dramatic, dramatic change in their use of personnel. But speaking uh, directly about Teran Matthew, uh, what they do a lot of, and I think you'll see it this week, is they also play a lot of cover two, but it's how they get to it. Now, in cover two, Matthew is their middle hole defender. Um, you know, everybody thinks Tampa two, you have a linebacker that kind of runs that middle. Well, Matthew is that guy. And the reason he is that guy is because he has such a great feel and understanding of routes. And he has, he, and because they like to disguise it, with a lot of late movement, he is really good getting into that middle hole area. And I think I would expect them to do that. I think Josh Allen has advanced to the point where maybe a year or so ago, people would have felt that, hey, you can get him with disguise and late movement. And I'm not going to sit here and say you'll never get a quarterback with late movement. I've seen, you know, veterans who've been in the league 12 years be, you know, uh, be hurt by that. But I think that Steve Spagnuolo will feel that, hey, Let's disguise. Let's move late. Let's make Josh Allen have to think after the ball snapped. And even though he's a great second reaction movement player, if you can get a quarterback doing that and playing a little frenetically, you'd rather do that than have a quarterback just feel comfortable sitting in the pocket. If if they do play dime in the percentages you're talking about, or maybe even a little and they more will. or whatever. They will. Uh, is their dime personnel package – good enough to stop the Bills running game in its current state? Well, uh, 
they kind of move people around Sorensen very often. And he's not a big guy, Daniel Sorensen. He, he started early in the year and then they moved Thornhill into the starting safety and Sorensen right. became the dime player. Yeah, that happened That um, happened in week six, right after the Bills yeah. came. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it probably, they probably wanted to do it after the dig 61 yard completion when Sorensen, uh, you know, looked like a slow safety, but, um, uh, but you're right about that. So he's the dime. Um, Often he lines up in the box. They still at times match him up to the tight end when they play man, which to me would not be a good matchup this week against Austin Knox. Uh, so I'm very curious to see what Steve Spagnuolo will do because, you know, I think I think there are some troublesome matchups in this game for the Chiefs on the back end. Um, you know, they've got to be able to generate pressure up front. Uh, but they will play dime, Steve, for sure. I mean, they've been doing that all year. They're not all of a sudden going to play no dime. And then with respect to the Bills' defensive approach, in the last two regular season meetings, Greg, they haven't blitzed Mahomes. Um, no. They, they've chose to, you know, drop seven, drop eight, whatever it is, uh, largely depend on a four-man rush. Knowing, yep. that, knowing that Buffalo's four-man rush has been a lot more successful down the stretch here this season and just to give you an idea, Greg, 22 sacks in their last five games, counting last week, that's the most in the league over that span. Do you think Leslie Frazier goes into this game confident that he can employ that same strategy and not have to blitz Patrick Mahomes much at all again? Well, for a veteran like Leslie Frazier, who, who is a player and a coach, I'm not sure, Chris, the word would be confident, you know, because they don't talk <laughs> like that. But uh, but I would think that that would be the approach. Now, they played a lot of split safety in the last game. They played, you know, a lot of zone. They played some man coverage in, in the last game, two man coverage. And they actually played that at a dime in the last game. I don't know if they'll do that this this time, but I would think that they would stay with the approach of, of a lot of zone and a four man pressure. Um, Look, the, the Chiefs are a better offense. That was in that stretch when Mahomes was kind of struggling with a lot of unnecessary random movement. He was not a comfortable quarterback. He's been a lot more comfortable over the last six, seven weeks. And when he does move, it looks much more calculated and much more controlled. But, yeah, I, I, I can't see them blitzing now. That doesn't mean they'll never blitz, Chris. But yeah. it's certainly not going to be a high percentage. You know, I mean, they might find a situation where they feel, hey, you know, they're not expecting it. And we think we we understand what their protection is going to be in this situation. And, and we feel we can break it down. But it certainly will not be high percentage blitz. No. How big an effect will Poyer and Hyde or can they have? And I mean, you've we've seen how well they play and we hear about yeah. how, you know, how good they are back there together. Does they that are. give Buffalo's defense a different look for Pat Mahomes than any other defense he's faced or some of the more difficult ones? How are they going to make a, have an effect on Mahomes? Well, I think what can be interesting is, is how they deploy Hyde and Poyer. Because obviously, if you're studying tape and, and teams study it in far more detail than I can, um, there's, there's tendencies with Poyer and Hyde, just like there's tendencies with every defense. So the question I have, and, and I think these guys are really smart, savvy players, is I think you can change up your tendencies a bit because those guys are so smart. And I would not surprise me to do that if they do that, because all you're trying to do with any quarterback is make him have to do a lot of thinking after the snap of the ball, because that slows down the, the decision-making process. And that's what you want. From a personnel standpoint, Greg, not playing in that week five game, Chris Jones, Matt Milano, Yep. And then you have players that have emerged here at the end of the season for both teams, respectively, probably most notable McKenzie and Devin Singletary for Buffalo and probably Byron Pringle and Jarek McKinnon yes. for the Chiefs. Who do you think of that group makes the biggest difference in this matchup this time around? Well, obviously, the, the Bills won that game. Was it 38-20? Was that the score? Yes. Yes. So it would be hard for me to say Milano because they they only they held the Chiefs to 20, but I think Milano is a really important player in their defense. Um, I think Chris Jones is a huge, huge factor. Um, he's a really good inside pass rusher. Uh, I assume that uh, the left guard will be Bates. Is 
what's Daryl Williams status? He's fine. He's fine. Good to go. He'll be right guard. Okay. So, I mean, I think they'll feel good. You know, I, I think Daryl Williams has, has been a good player at right guard. So I think that, you know, but I still think Chris Jones is a load to handle and he, he can disrupt your, your offensive line. So I think he's a really important player. You mentioned McKinnon watching that tape last week. It looked like he was shot out of a can. He's electric. Um, yeah, he was phenomenal, both in the run game. They're not obviously they're a pass first team, just like the Bills are. But, you know, he had 12 carries. Obviously, it, it was a game that it was close, actually, through much of the first half until late in the first half. But but he was very effective both as a runner and as a receiver. And as you guys both know, the Bill, uh, the Chiefs have an outstanding screen game. And you're seeing a screen right here, which I did not know was coming up. But there you go. Um, so the, they have an outstanding screen game of which McKinnon can be a really foundational piece. And he really looked good last week. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost thinking even if Edwards Alaire is ready to go and all indications are he is practicing fully this week, McKinnon's going to get some run. I mean, he, putting an extra no speed guy on the field like him, I mean, he's a 4-4 guy and he's 216 pounds, Greg. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I'd be hard pressed. Look, Andy Reid knows his players better than I do, clearly, but I'd be surprised if you take this guy off the field. I mean, this guy, he's dynamic. I mean, Edward Tolaire is obviously a good player, but he hasn't played in a long time, and McKinnon is absolutely dynamic. What do you expect from, and we were talking about this at the end of the regular season up until the, the Patriots game, the Bills' pass rush had come alive a little bit and led the league over the last four weeks of the regular season in pass rush and in sacks. Um, what was in that, and what can we do in the big picture, can we expect them to help with a four-man rush? How effective would you expect the Bills to be against a guy like Mahomes, who is so savvy? I mean, I, I don't think that's still, still at this point with Poyer and Hyde and Levi Wallace in the secondary, the the pass rush still isn't the engine that runs that defense. How good does it have to be? Well, I'll say this. The Chiefs pass game um, has really changed. Uh, they, they are now very rhythmic with a really good timing feel. Uh, Mahomes hits that back foot. The ball comes out. I mean, you just have to look at someone like Tyreek Hill averaging about 11 yards per catch this year. You don't see, I know he caught the 31 yard touchdown last week against Cam Sutton, but that was a fade ball. They really have not been as vertical a pass game by design as they really were in, in Mahomes earlier seasons. So they worked with him clearly because he had so much unnecessary movement that was causing problems for them early in the season. They've really worked with him and he deserves a ton of credit for buying in. But this offense has become much more rhythmic. It has much more of a timing feel to it. He gets the ball out. So, you know, again, pass rush doesn't become a factor in those situations where it's going to have to be a factor, Steve, is when you get into the long yardage situations and the drop by the quarterback becomes deeper. The last one we've got for you here, Greg, concerns the other AFC divisional playoff, Bengals and Titans. Yeah. Bills fans are rooting for the Bengals because they know if the Bills win and the Bengals win, the AFC title games in Buffalo, um, the Titans may have something to say about that, though. Knowing Derrick Henry is a possible option, does it even – my question is, I don't know that it matters terribly because they've been pretty productive with Deontay Foreman running the ball, haven't they? Yeah, but he's still not Derrick Henry, and Henry no. will play. And and Henry, if you, if you're activating Henry, which they will, and I don't know if they've done so yet, but they will. He, they're not, you're not activating him to get six carries, so he's going to be the, he's going to be Derrick Henry. I mean, in terms of usage, we don't know what he's going to look like. But no, you're right. They've run the ball well, but that's their mo. That's what they do. That their offense is kind of built that way. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Look, I think the bigger matchup in that game, quite honestly, Chris, is I think it's the Titans front four, which you guys know well is a yeah. very, very good front four versus that Bengals O-line, which quite honestly is not a great pass protecting O-line. Yeah, I think it's going to yeah. cause problems for them for sure. They want to have a lot of quick game early if you're, yeah. <laughs> if you're Zach yeah. Taylor for that one. Right. Uh, Greg, as always, thanks very much. Enjoy the games this weekend. Thanks, Greg. All right, we'll catch up with you. All right, guys, appreciate it. Thanks so much.